According to Vauxhall, over a quarter of all British drivers have at some point either owned or driven an example of their Astra family hatch in the 40 years that this model line's been on sale. A pretty significant car for our market then, and it still is. Hence the importance of the changes made to this seventh generation model. Improvements that the brand hopes will rejuvenate its appeal. That would be timely, firstly because this model has to now face down completely new versions of its two biggest family hatch rivals, the Ford Focus and the Volkswagen Golf, and secondly because the appeal of this car amongst private buyers has rather waned in recent years. Astra sales are still strong, but that's mainly because 80% of production goes to fleets. It's really quite rare these days to find an individual prepared to ignore the appeal of glitzy arrivals or trendy SUVs and put down money for one. Vauxhall's out to convince you that you should, and to that end has given this car a completely fresh lineup of all aluminium three cylinder petrol and diesel power plants mated to a revitalized range of transmissions. Now, we'd expected that the engines would be borrowed from Peugeot's and Citroën's, as has been the case with most new Vauxhall's that have been launched since the PSA Group's takeover of the brand back in 2017. But no, these date from the General Motors era. Despite that, they offer class leading running cost figures that are significantly better than before with updated Euro emissions compliance, uh, which should bring key tax savings, particularly to business buyers. Other changes to this uh, seventh generation K-series model are less significant. There's still the same choice of either five-door hatch or sports tourer estate models, but both body styles get a few equipment updates and some minor styling tweaks. To be fair, relatively few changes in other areas were really needed. We always recommended this design highly as an all-round driver's car and, if it was priced rightly, as a complete family hatchback package. Plus, for what it's worth, it's still made in this country and it's the only Vauxhall apart from the Vivaro van that now is, although that looks as if it might change in the future. For the time being though, this Astra wears its British badge proudly and it wants to convince you that the 3 million UK sales that this model line's racked up since 1979 undergird a product with a depth of development that rivals just can't match. It's certainly an underrated car, but is it one you should consider buying? Let's find out. We'd forgotten just how good the Astra is to drive and we're not alone. Cast around for opinions on the dynamically most adept family hatchbacks and this Vauxhall probably won't even figure, but Rob Wilson knows different. Now, you won't have heard of him, but most Formula One stars have. He's the highly respected driver coach that over the years, many of them have turned to in a quest to improve their skills on a circuit that was created by Rob at the Bruntingthorpe Airfield in Leicestershire. Now, for tuition on this track, you'd expect him to have chosen something all low slung and exotic, or perhaps some kind of race refugee. But instead, Wilson's car of choice for many years has been an ordinary Vauxhall Astra. It has, he says, a beautiful balance, one you wouldn't expect normally to find in a car of this kind. And in the improved version of this uh, seventh generation model, it's even better, aided by revised spring and damper rates that improve the ride over poor surfaces and by a fresh calibration for the steering, which improves handling at higher speeds. Uh, Rob reckons the changes have made this car significantly faster around his circuit and Racing Point F1 driver Lance Stroll, who has lapped it incessantly, apparently he likes his Astra so much that he's thinking of buying one and adding it to his Canadian collection of cars which have been influential to his career. All of which is rather surprising because uh, this Vauxhall's fundamental engineering CV looks no more promising than it did when we first tested this K-series design back in 2015. There's still, for example, no sign of the sophisticated multi-link rear suspension setup that the so-called magazine experts will tell you makes so much difference to the fine driving dynamics of more powerful Golf and Focus models in this segment. Uh, the engineers behind this car rejected that idea from the outset on the grounds of cost and packaging compromise. Instead, they stuck with proven technology, a straightforward torsion beam rear axle, and then they embellished that with the 
addition of a clever Watts linkage suspension system. Now that is apparently there to reduce sideways motion between the axle and the body of the car as you go through the corners, hence the beautiful balance that we referenced earlier. That whole setup works especially well on this Mark 7 Astra design, partly because the uh, body shell is particularly stiff and partly because so much weight was taken out of it at this design's original launch. Entry-level petrol versions of this car now tip the scales uh, no, no more than around 1.2 tonnes, uh, which is more the kind of figure that you'd expect to find in a smaller Super Mini. Here again, this revised model has improved things further with an additional six kilos of weight on petrol versions saved as as part of the switch away from 1.4 litre four cylinder engines. Now you can still get a green pump fueled 1.4 litre Astra but now it's a three cylinder unit and it can only be had with 145 PS uh, in a form mated to a seven speed CVT auto gearbox. Now that might suit our older town based buyers but everyone else in search of a petrol powered Astra will almost certainly gravitate towards the alternative 1.2 litre three cylinder unit which is only offered with manual transmission and that's the engine that the majority of buyers uh, of this Vauxhall are now expected to choose. We'd expected both this 1.2 litre power plant and all the new engines added into this improved model to be the PSA group units borrowed from Peugeot and Citroen, uh, which you'll find in the current Corsa and in both the Vauxhall's SUVs. But work on the enhanced engines earmarked for this Astra was already well underway when the PSA group bought the Vauxhall and Opel brands from General Motors in 2017 and the French conglomerate decided to see it through. Uh, why? we're not quite sure because the uh, the production life of those units is likely to be extremely short given that the next generation Astra is certain to be a thoroughly PSA group engineered product. That is something of a pity because this Vauxhall's freshly installed 1.2 litre power plant is really rather impressive. It offers a sparkling, eager, revy feel, an electrically controlled variable vane turbo, more swiftly builds boost, and it benefits from a balancer shaft to quell the vibrations that you would find in some other three-cylinder installations, uh, Ford's rival EcoBoost unit, for example. Uh, for Astra drivers, it comes in three flavors with 110, 130, and 145 PS, uh, the different outputs separated only by tiny software tweaks. At first glance, the performance figures don't seem to vary very much between those three variants. Rest to 60 takes 10.2 seconds in the 110 PS model, 9.9 uh, .9 in the 130 PS version and 9.7 in the 145 PS variant. On the road though there's more difference than you might think and an extra 30 Nm of torque uh, which has been injected into the top two derivatives makes quite a lot of difference to the top speed which rises from 124 to 134 miles an hour in the 130 PS model and then on to 136 seven miles an hour in the 145 PS version and that really can feel like quite good fun. As in the original version of this Mark 7 model, a slight issue is the relative lack of feedback from the steering. Uh, the altered calibration doesn't seem to have helped that very much, uh, which is a pity because the helm's accurate and well weighted. You just have to learn to trust it in a way that isn't necessary in impressive handling rivals that we've recently tried, like Ford's Focus and the Mazda 3. Um, we didn't think that adding another 115 kilos into the nose of the car would help much in that regard, and it doesn't. Now that's what will happen if you decide to ignore the current zeitgeist and specify a diesel engine in your Astra instead. Uh, this is another new three-cylinder unit, uh, this time 1.5 litres in size and offered with either 105 PS or, as in this case, 122 PS. You almost certainly want the gutsier version, uh, which improves the baseline unit's performance figures, rest to 60 miles an hour in 10.4 seconds, en route to 124 miles an hour to 9.9 seconds, and 130 miles an hour. That's if you specify the manual 1.5 litre 122 PS model. Vauxhall wanted us to try the automatic variant for this test, mainly because the uh, self-shifting torque converter transmission in question is completely new. It's the company's first nine-speed auto. And it certainly shifts smoothly between the ratios, but it isn't as willing to kick down as instantly as we'd like at short notice, at which point you uh, do rather notice this diesel's rather vocal character. And that 
that's something that's also evident when the car's idling. Don't get us wrong, in refinement terms, it's certainly a useful improvement over the old 1.6 litre CDTI unit, and there are really no significant issues at cruising speeds, and those are aided by this revised design's aerodynamic improvements. Overall though, rival diesels in this class still feel a little more hushed. Mind you, they are usually much less efficient, and we're gonna to get to that later in the cost section of this film. Is there anything else you need to know about the drive experience on offer here? Well, not much. Uh, there aren't any other engines on offer. Uh, there's nothing more powerful and more significantly, there's nothing that's in any way electrified, which is something of a disappointment given the direction of the current market. Uh, now, we referenced this car's improved ride earlier, uh, potholes, speed humps and tarmac tears and are dispatched with greater fluency. Uh, that's providing you stick to the smaller wheel sizes. And the cameras which control this car's front and rear safety features have been improved. Uh, the former lens is now capable of identifying pedestrians and of braking the car to avoid them uh, should your attention be elsewhere. Um, it is, in fact, in short, a strong showing. Is it strong enough to sustain sales of this car against completely redesigned versions of both its toughest competitors? Well, only time will tell. Mid-term facelifts are usually all style over substance. Here it's the other way around, which is good, but ideally the Astra needed both if it was to reassert its position towards the head of the family hatchback segment. Fortunately for Vauxhall, most close rivals also look a touch conservative, perhaps as an antidote to a sea of overstyled SUVs. To be fair, there's not much wrong with the smart silhouette. It was originally inspired by the brand's Monza concept car of 2014, and it was penned by British designer Mark Adams. As before, there's a choice of two body styles, this five-door hatch or an alternative sports tourer estate. You'd need to be a salesperson or a fanatically loyal Astra owner to notice the visual changes made, and they're only really evident at the front. Uh, the twin chrome lines that previously flanked the central brand badge on the grill have been replaced by a single silver strip here. Now that flows into the daytime running light elements in the headlamps, which now feature full LED illumination on most models. Plus they offer the option of matrix technology, which will adapt elements of the beam to specific road conditions. Uh, the bumper has been revised too, uh, to incorporate these revised corner cutouts for the fog lamps, which on plusher models like this one now sit below chrome strips. Uh, more significant though is a feature that you can't see, and that's the way that the upper and lower portions of the grille now automatically open and close independently of each other, and that's primarily to reduce aerodynamic drag. There aren't any changes made in profile apart from some fresh wheel rim designs, which as before vary in size between 16 and 18 inches. Uh, we've got the 17 inch multi-spoke alloys here. Uh, the key side perspective design feature remains this unusual divided C pillar, which is there to create the impression of a floating roof. Like other GM models designed in its era, this one gets a characteristic lower blade line flowing up from the sills towards the rear, uh, while above it, there's an equally distinctive higher crease. The alternative Sports Tourer Estate variant sits on a lengthier wheelbase, uh, so it measures in at a substantial 332 millimeters longer. There aren't any significant changes to talk about at the rear. Uh, the stretched taut surfaces still look sleek and we like the way that the interplay of light and shadow is emphasized by this central crease that sits above the brand logo there and it links the rear lights. Uh, the digital rear view camera that would be fitted back here on the flagship variant is apparently now of much higher quality. So if you do have a version of this Vauxhall that has it, you won't now be viewing a dashboard image that looks like something from TV in the 80s. Uh, of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff that you can't see See the lightweight vehicle architecture, which allowed the original version of this K-series seventh generation model to save around 200 kilos over the curb weight of its predecessor. Right, let's take a seat at the wheel.
Now, you don't expect a cabin redesign with a facelifted model. Uh, usually, there are just a few trim embellishments, uh, maybe a different infotainment screen. Well, there's hardly anything here, just a few different upholstery and door card finishes, uh, which, to be frank, aren't really much of an improvement. It is just as well, then, that few fundamental changes were really needed. As before, the characteristic fascia element is what Vauxhall refers to as a blade-style panel that stretches right across the cabin, and that remains ergonomic, quite nicely finished, and on a plusher variant like this one, relatively smart, although there's not the depth of quality that you would feel in a rival Volkswagen Group product. That is especially the case lower down the range. With plusher variants like this one though, the brand of course has tried a bit harder with extras like leather seats and this superb stitched three-spoke sports steering wheel. Uh, the rest of the decor is the kind of thing that you now routinely find on a car of this kind. Shiny piano black decorates the face shirt, the center stack, and the door pulls with silver highlights around the gear stick, the control dials, uh, the vents, and the instrument gauges. With the original version of this 7th generation K-series model, the big cabin talking point was the inclusion of the OnStar concierge system, which, at the press of a button, connected you through to an operator who was able to supply journeying info and help 24-7 in the case of an emergency or a breakdown. That old GM-sourced setup has now been replaced by another optional package, eCall, uh, which Vauxhall promises will do much the same thing, although, unlike OnStar, it isn't K capable of uh, downloading destination directions into the sat-nav straight from the operator. Talking of navigation, you'll find it fitted on most models, uh, the mapping viewed on a central dash touchscreen that'll be either 7 inches or, as in this case, 8 inches in size, depending on the spec level that you stretch to, uh, as well as the usual DAB tuner and Bluetooth connectivity. All the monitors on offer feature Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, and that's without the kind of subscription levy that rival brands often ask for uh, for that kind of setup after a few years of use but you'll have to stretch to this bigger screen to get any sort of voice activation. As part of this 8-inch screen multimedia Navi Pro package, you also get a digital instrument cluster. Well, a kind of digital instrument cluster anyway. Uh, the binnacle display you view here through the steering wheel is also 8 inches in size, which isn't big enough to show the kind of full mapping that other mass market models are now starting to introduce into their instrument cluster screens. In fact, there is still quite a lot that's uh, completely analog here, either side of the central monitor, uh, those conventionally needled outer gauges for revs, for temperature and fuel. They don't light up until you twist the ignition key. The middle digital part of the layout, though, can certainly show you an awful lot. Two crescent-shaped virtual gauges, oil temp on the left and battery voltage on the right, flank a central screen offering two configurable layout themes, touring, which gives you a prominent digital speedo, and sport, which gives you a circular dial-shaped virtual speed gauge. As well as those two styles of velocity reading, uh, there's also space here to view plenty else. A left tab option shortcuts you into info, audio, nav and phone settings, while a right tab option allows you to tailor the full list of data that the central screen can show, and there's an awful lot of it. Uh, trip computer info, remaining oil life, tyre pressures, a timer, traffic sign readouts, driver assistance settings, uh, your following distance to the vehicle in front, info on cabin energy consumers, an economy trend graph, an eco-index screen that shows how frugally you're driving, and on a diesel, your add blue fluid level two. With the sport layout, where all this appears in the center of the circular virtual speed gauge, you can also insert a digital speed readout. Enough on screens, uh, most Astra trim levels don't give you this fancy multimedia Navi Pro package, so you only get the center dash monitor, and through the steering wheel, you'll view a little trip computer readout, which is flanked by conventional analog gauges. Uh, the speedometer, like the one on this model's virtual screen, is rather annoyingly delineated in 20 miles an hour increments, which means that you'll miss out on the important 30 and 70 miles an hour markers. 
What else? Um, well, we should probably reference the fact that Vauxhall has finally got around to offering a couple of extra cost features which uh, the competitor models have provided for ages, a wireless phone charging mat and also a heated windscreen. And selected top models can now add in a high-end Bose sound system with a rich bass subwoofer under the boot floor. We'll finish with the basics. Uh, finding a comfortable driving position is straightforward, and that's courtesy of ample steering wheel and seat adjustment. Uh, on the base variants, we'd want to pay the small amount extra that Vauxhall asks for the 16-way adjustable driver's ergonomic active seat, which holds you more comfortably and securely. It includes lumbar support, and it's certified by the German AGR organization, who campaign for seat design that's better suited to healthier backs. Unfortunately, the 12-way adjustable leather-clad chairs fitted to top models like this one aren't quite as supportive. Anyway, uh, once you've got yourself as comfortable as you can be, then you'll find that your uh, forward view is pretty good, and that's thanks to narrow windscreen pillars and decently sized front side windows. Unfortunately, the thick rear pillars obscure rearward visibility, so it is disappointing to find that parking sensors cost quite a lot extra on virtually all models, and that rear view camera we mentioned earlier isn't even available across most of the range. Cabin storage meets the required class standard. Uh, the glove box is big, it incorporates coin slots and a pen clip, and it's the only one we can think of in a PSA grip model which isn't severely compromised in size by the fuse box behind the dashboard. <laughs> That's because, of course, uh, this car wasn't originally designed as a PSA grip model. Uh, what else? Um, well, the door bins, they're reasonably sized. They'll take a couple of 500 mil bottles, but those bottles will jiggle about because the, uh, the molding isn't fashioned into any sort of holder for them. Uh, there is a phone sized cubby here embedded in the center stack but you probably won't want to put your phone in there uh, because uh, there are no USB ports nearby. Uh, you'll find those instead in this small lidded box between the seats and that also incorporates an SD card slot and an aux in point. Just in front there's a compartment with a sliding cover which conceals two cup holders and nearby is a 12 volt port. An overhead sunglasses compartment that's missing and for some reason uh, the sun visors have ticket clips mounted on their forward facing sides. But this spacious compartment down here by the driver's right knee is very handy. Right, let's take a seat in the back. Uh, now, looking at this Astra's tapering roofline, you might expect rear cabin space to be a touch restricted, so let's see. Now, the door opens nice and wide, which is good, but because of the angular rear C-pillar design, you'll have to step around this rather prominently pointed trailing edge. Once inside, it's actually a lot more spacious than the exterior dimensions and the outward styling lead you to expect. Now, with the original version of this Mark 7 Astra, the designers pulled off the magic trick of reducing the wheelbase by 20 millimeters at the same time as improving rear legroom by 35 millimeters. Uh, we're still surprised by that. Uh, there is almost as much space for your knees as you find in a Skoda Octavia, and that is the family hatch class leader in this regard. Uh, scalloped front seat backs help here, as does the way that you can uh, slide your feet properly right under the seat in front. There's even decent headroom too, and because the central transmission tunnel is nice and low, a third middle seated adult can be accommodated uh, without too much spatial embarrassment should the need arise. Not such good news for Vauxhall dealers is the fact that all this rear cabin space virtually matches what you get in the brand's apparently bigger Insignia model. Um, a central armrest that is provided, but unfortunately uh, it doesn't incorporate any cup holders. Uh, there are roof mounted reading lights, there are seat back pockets, uh, there are coat hooks, by the overhead grab handles and in the doors there are uh, reasonably sized bins and there's a further little cubby by the power window switch. Plusher models like this one is uh, get centrally mounted twin USB ports and rear seat heating too. 
Finally, let's take a look at luggage space. And that's another area you'd think might have been compromised by this seventh generation model's slight reduction in size. Actually, when you raise the tailgate in this hatch version, there's a very usable 370 litre space. That's measured up to the parcel shelf. Now true, that isn't an especially noteworthy figure by current class standards, but it isn't a bad showing for a car that's less than 4.4 metres in length. Uh, now earlier we did mention the uh, Sports Tourer version's longer wheelbase. Well, as you'd expect, uh, that does facilitate a much greater level of capacity, 540 litres. That's the figure that stays the same, even if you add in the optional spare wheel. That isn't, though, the case in this hatch version, where adding in the spare means a higher boot floor. Still, in this case, uh, there is at least uh, space underneath the cargo base, around the tyre and the wheel, for odd items that you might want to keep out of sight. In terms of boot usability, you get a couple of bag hooks and the usual four tie-down points. Uh, there's no sign of a 12 volt socket though. Um, if you need more room and you want to fold the rear seats, then you'd ideally want the convenient 40-20-40 split backrest that we have featured here. But that's only included on the priciest trim level and it can't be had as an option. So you'll probably be stuck with a more conventional 60-40 split, which means if you want to take long items, then you'll be inconveniencing rear seated folk. What about when you push everything forward? Well, normally on cars like this one, which can't be specified with an adjustable height boot floor, as is unfortunately the case with this Astra, you tend to get quite a step up in the boot floor over the folded seats. Uh, the higher boot floor that comes with that optional spare wheel avoids that issue here. Uh, with everything folded in this hatch body style, there's 1,210 litres of space, and that's measured up to the roof. In the Sports Tour Estate, that figure rises to 1,650. 30 litres. Vauxhall is keen to point out that list pricing hasn't changed much, and that's despite the more sophisticated engine technology and the higher levels of equipment. Uh, from the launch of this revised model, that meant figures kicking off from around £19,000 and rising to around £30,000 at the top of the range. If you want the Sports Tour Estate variant rather than this five-door hatch, then you'll need to budget for an extra premium of around £1,500. Forget any ideas you might have had of ordering an Astra in base three-door hatch form or indeed as either a hot hatch VXR, a GTC Coupe or as any sort of convertible. Variants like that are no longer part of Vauxhall's business plan. That is understandable in the current market, but a complete absence of the kind of mild hybrid, plug-in or full electric technology that rivals now offer isn't. Now this will be corrected when this K-Series Astra model makes way for a PSA Group platform replacement model in due course. But let's focus more on what you can have right here and right now. The core trim levels, base SE, Business Edition Nav and SRI Nav apply both to this five-door hatch and to the Sports Tourer body style. Uh, this hatch also adds some extra spec level options, two for mid-range buyers, a straight SRI version without navigation and a better equipped SRI VX line model, and two for the top of the range, the plush Elite Nav spec we're trying here and the top luxurious Ultimate Nav trim. What about engines? Well, as you may have seen in the driving experience section of this film, the core part of the lineup is built around Vauxhall's fresh range of three cylinder, 1.2 litre petrol and 1.5 litre diesel power plants. Now, if you're focusing on petrol power, it's very difficult to see why you wouldn't pay the 300 pound premium necessary to go from the base 110 PS unit to the gutsier 130 PS engine. With plusher trim levels, there's an equally small premium to go further and get the perkiest 145 PS 1.2 litre variant, which would probably be our Astra version of choice in the current lineup. A little confusingly, there is also a second petrol engine Astra offering 145 PS. This one makes a 1.4 litre engine to a stepless CVT auto gearbox, and it's aimed primarily at older, low mileage private buyers. Most business buyers loyal to Astra Motoring will give those petrol units a mere cursory glance on their way to sign an order for another diesel. Uh, the 1.5 litre black pump fueled unit requires a premium of just over a thousand pounds over its petrol counterpart and it kicks off in base 105 PS guys at around the 20,000 pound price point. Most will want to pay the 425 pound premium to get that engine in its uprated 122 PS guys and if you do that and you've chosen the hatch body style you'll be off 
offered the further option of paying £1,655 more to add in Vauxhall's latest nine-speed auto gearbox. And that is the package that we're trying here. Before we go on to look at how this pricing compares to direct rivals from other brands, it's probably worth mentioning how that positions this Astra in Vauxhall's wider model range. Now there's long been quite a price overlap between this car and its larger Insignia Grand Sport showroom stablemate, and there still is. Uh, the price premium for a base petrol Insignia over say a 130 PS 1.2 litre petrol Astra is actually no more than around 800 pounds. And the base diesel Insignia costs around about the same as an Astra with the 122 PS 1.5 litre diesel engine we're trying here. Now yes, of course, the Astra will be much more economical, but the Insignia is a larger, more spacious car, so food for thought. If you don't mind slightly less cabin space than you get in an Astra, provided an extra dose of style and fashion is delivered in return, then your dealer will point out that the brand's compact Crossland X SUV can be yours for much the same money as you'd pay for a directly equivalent Astra. If it's a family hat you want though, then your point of comparison against this car will come from other brands. Now you might not be surprised to hear that Astra pricing closely replicates that of the car which is probably its closest rival, Ford's Focus. The Focus is a more modern design, but this Astra now enjoys an important advantage in running cost efficiency. Uh, that could be significant. Uh, thinking of this car's other key segment rival, Volkswagen's Golf, well you might want to think again if you don't like the idea of having to find a substantial model for model premium of around £3,000. A premium over Astra ownership will also be necessary if you want to consider either of this Vauxhall's PSA Group family hatch cousins. A Citroen C4 Cactus will cost you around £1,000 more, while for an equivalent Peugeot 308, you'll need to budget at least around £1,500 extra. What else might you be considering? Um, well, a Renault Megane or a Skoda Scala might save you a few hundred pounds, but both would cost you significantly more to run. Uh, Skoda's other contender in this segment, the Octavia, that costs around about the same as an Astra, and you'd also pay a similar amount for popular contenders in this segment, like Seat's Leon, Kia's Seed, and Hyundai's i30. But again, none of those cars can match this Vauxhall's levels of efficiency. As for other contenders, well, a Fiat Tipo would certainly save you a few thousand, but it would cost a lot more to run. It is more likely that you'll be considering something like a Honda Civic against this Astra. Uh, one of those would cost you around 500 pounds more to buy, and you need to budget around 2,000 pounds more for equivalent versions of the Mazda 3, the Mini Clubman, and for the 1.2 litre versions of the Toyota Corolla. If having considered all those options, you've put them to one side, you've rejected the pull towards SUV ownership, and you've decided it is an Astra that you really like, then you're gonna to need to know just how generous Vauxhall has been with the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. Even base SE spec gives you 16 inch alloy wheels, auto headlamps, dark tinted rear windows, powered heated mirrors, LED daytime running lights, and on the Sports Tourer variant, roof rails too. Inside there's air conditioning, there's a multifunction trip computer and cruise control with a speed limiter. Infotainment that's taken care of by a seven inch center dash multimedia system with Bluetooth, a six speaker DAB audio system and a USB audio connection. There's also Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. And that's a feature that some other brands will levy a subscription for after a few years of use. Vauxhall doesn't. As usual with this kind of setup, you'll be able to duplicate the functionality of your smartphone handset onto your car's infotainment screen to access maps and message reading, as well as apps like Stitcher, Podcast, Spotify, and Umano. The starting point of the range for company buyers will be a business edition nav variant, which, as the trim name suggests, embellishes SE spec with navigation, plus it also gets full LED headlights, a leather covered steering wheel, and a front central armrest. The most popular trim option in the range amongst both private and company customers though is mid-level SRI spec, and that's available either with or without built-in navigation. Now this flavor of Astra is identifiable from the base models by its larger 17-inch twin-spoke alloy wheels and its chrome effect window surrounds. Plus, as well as the LED headlights, you get rain-sensing wipers, front seat back pockets, an alarm, and an anti-dazzle rear view mirror. Uh, there is also a plusher SRI VX line now 
nav variant, which throws in 18 inch wheels, front fog lights and dark rear tinted windows too. For us though, the main draw to settle on some kind of SRI variant over a baseline Astra derivative would lie in two things. First, that you have to buy into at least this level in the range to get any kind of camera driven safety kit on.